Boys, today I'm going to review Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Beneath the Planet of the Apes came out in 1970 and is the second in the original series of Ape films. It was directed by Ted Post, screenplay was by Paul Dean, music by Leonard Rosenman. The film runs 95 minutes and cost 2.5 million to make. It made back 19 million. However, the film had mixed reviews at the time, but now is highly regarded among fans. Charlton Heston was persuaded to reprise his role from the first film, however only as a supporting part. James Francisco is the main lead of the film. It's the only film in the original series not to star Ruddy McDowell, because at the time he was directing the film. There was a novelisation of the film by Michael Avalon in 1970. There was also a comic strip adaptation of the film. The film stars... James Francisco as Brent, Kim Hunter as Dr. Zira, Morris Evans as Dr. Zeos, Linda Harrison as Nova, and Charlton Heston as Taylor. So this film follows on directly from the first film, where you see Charlton Heston playing Taylor, and his character says the Statue of Liberty at the end of the first film, that brilliant ending. So it's almost like a two-parter because it follows on directly from the first film. And because Charlton Heston didn't want to be in all the film, he wanted his character killed off, he disappears at the beginning of the film and then pops up later at the end of the film. And instead the male lead is played by James Francisco, a character called Brent who was following Taylor's spaceship. So he also crash lands on the, the planet. So the film is mostly from his point of view. He meets Nova and he asks her what happened to Taylor. So she shows him where he disappeared. So it's a strange sequel, this one. Got a totally different tone from the first film. And it's more of a, an anti-war film. Because Brent finds these mutant earthlings who mutated after a nuclear war. And they become telepaths. So they've got these special powers. <laughs> Mr. Brent, we're a patient people, but we are determined to know what the apes want, war or peace. The only weapons we have are purely illusion. And the weirdest thing is the, the prayer to a, a nuclear missile that's underneath the planet. So James Francisco, he was also in Dario Argento's Cat of Nine Tales. So he's a good actor and he's good in this. However, it would have been nice if Charlton Heston had have had the role all the way through the film because Heston's a better actor. It's also a pity Ruddy McDowell wasn't in the film because he's a great actor in his role as Cornelius but they get this other guy to play Cornelius and he, he does a good impersonation of Ruddy McDowell but you can tell it's not him. However, Kim Hunter's back as Dr. Zaira and she's really funny in this. I, I like her character. She doesn't take any shit off the higher ups. <laughs> and Morris Evans is also back from the first film. As Dr. Zeos. He's one of my favourite characters. He, he's great. And he has some good moments in this film. However, I, I think he was better in the first film. And Linda Harrison is also back as Nova. And she has a strange look because she has um, bushy eyebrows. Hey, Phil, Nova's hot. I like her bushy eyebrows. I wonder what else is bushy. <laughs> oh, it's my don't be rude again. It's also sad when she gets killed off. There's a brilliant moment between her and Charlton Heston where she dies in his arms. I thought that was a great moment, that. Should let them all die. The gorillas every damn... Like the first film, there's great location work in this one where you see the beach and the waves, the, the sound of the waves crashing. It's very effective. Not only are the locations good, but the, the film sets are good as well. Like these big sets of, of an underneath tunnel. And you see the lair where the, the nuclear weapons are, where the worship are it. There's also more action in this film than the first one. And there's more apes as well, although some of the ape makeup isn't as good as others. The best makeup 
the camera focuses more on them and the other apes are more in the background. So Ted Post, the director, he did a good job with this. So this is another good sequel that he did. And he also did Magnum Force for the Dirty Harry series. That was also the second film of five. He's, he's done two brilliant sequels for two film franchises. But where this film really picks up is the last 35 minutes when you encounter the telepaths, the mutated earth people from a nuclear war. And they're like a religious cult as well. It's totally weird. They wear these masks, these latex masks. So at first you think the, the human faces. And then there's a brilliant scene where they take off the masks. All of them take the masks off. And they're all mutated and, and ugly looking. And that scene, it, it, it's, it verges on horror. So from then on, it's almost like a horror film. Because when the, the unmasking scene, there's also organ music. So it's almost reminiscent of the Phantom of the Opera where he's unmasking. And when Charlton Heston's character reappears, um, it's about the last 15 minutes of the film. The film really does pick up. There's some gory bits, a uh, gory gunshot scene. And then the final, it's a brilliant end and very downbeat. It's one of the most downbeat endings ever. Where Heston's character finally presses a button in the nuclear weapon. It's a doomsday weapon. A doomsday bomb. They weren't satisfied with a bomb that could knock out a city. They finally built one with a cobalt casing. Oh, in the sweet name of peace. Oh, those bloody fools. They don't know what they've got. I mean, they, they pray to the damn thing. It explodes right at the end of the film. And you get this totally weird voice narration at the end. Saying that the planet's been destroyed. <laughs> that, that, that really, uh, it's a really um, disturbing narration to end the film on. One of the most downbeat endings ever. Hey, Phil, this is what's going to bloody happen one day. There's too many of them crazy bastards with nuclear weapons. Burn the planet to a cinder. How's that for your ultimate weapon? So it's an anti-war film. And it's interesting because at first it's just this small guerrilla group that are going to see what's underneath the planet. So it's that small scale. It escalates as war does until there's a, a nuclear weapon fired. And the, the Earth's finally destroyed. And that's symbolic of what happens with war and about what could happen. Because it's more relevant today than ever before because now we've never been so close to a nuclear war. My God, did we finally we finally really do it. Hey, Phil, I think we need to make a nuclear war shelter. It'll soon be bloody fireworks, dear soon. So overall, I think this is an underrated film. A classic film, to be honest. Brilliant sequel. And it's the last 35 minutes that elevates this film from good to great. So the stuff with the mutants, the telepaths, the best part of the film and of course the ending firing a, a doomsday weapon and the telepaths are interesting because they can manipulate people the way they think and say things it's almost symbolic of mainstream media how they can influence the public's perception the narrative they want them to show only bad points about it would be um, I would prefer Charlton Heston to have been all through the film Instead of at the beginning, then disappearing, and then at the end of the film. Would have been much better if he'd have just done the bloody film all the way through. And of course, Roddy McDowell, he would have been good if he'd uh, played Cornelius again. But th they got someone who was similar. And is it better than the first film? That's an interesting question. I can't really make my mind up yet. But when I review all the films, I'll do a ranking. And then I'll decide. But it's extremely close. It's almost a draw. So out of 10, I'd definitely give this one 10 top marks. That's a film. And the next film in the series would be Escape from the Planet of the Apes in 1971. So I'll review that one sometime. So what did you think, Bones? Did you like it? I thought it was bloody brilliant, Phil. 
Top Max! Okay, everybody, bye. Like, subscribe, and share. Bye. In one of the countless billions of galaxies in the universe lies a medium-sized star, and one of its satellites, a green and insignificant planet, is now dead.